Hi everybody, this is Gary Douglas, founder of Access Consciousness, and welcome to Conversations in Consciousness. Now, today we're going to have a really unique conversation from my point of view. It's like one of the things about Access that I find so exciting, among other things, but also sort of like bizarre. It's like, it's exciting and it's bizarre because it's like, literally I've had people that come from every race, color, religion, background, and they all seem to be able to change anything with access. So it's like today we have some very special guests. So I'm going to ask each one of them to announce who they are and where they're from. So. Hi, I'm Janvi. I'm from India and I'm a Hindu. Good. Hi, I'm Nilofar. I'm from uh, originally from India and I live in the United Arab Emirates and I'm Muslim. I'm Helen Gitlovich, and right now I live in Chicago, but originally I'm from Russia, and I'm Jewish. Hi, I'm Berenice. I live in Canada, but I'm originally from Mexico, and I have lived all over the world. Hi, I'm Mitzel Lowerson. I'm half Danish, half Mexican, but have been living in Canada, and will be moving to Japan. You're just sort of an international girl, aren't you? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abe Inab. I'm a uh, Arab uh, from Egypt, and I live in the United States and uh, been all over the world. And hello, I'm Cass uh, Thomas, and I work with Access. I am originally from the United States, Boston, and currently live in Italy, and uh, have lived in Paris and travel the world and coordinate language products. Yeah, uh, you're the, our language coordinator exactly. for, for Access. Yeah. You know, it's like Access is in 48 different countries at this point in time. And we have people in Turkey and we have people like all over the world. And we've had facilitators who've gone to Israel and we've had people who have gone to just about every friggin' country in the world and done Access classes there. And it's like all of you are different ethnicities, different religions, and yet, do you feel different? Not at all, Gary. No, not at all. <laughs> not different from one another. Yes, it's not different from one another. another. But you do <laughs> feel different from other people, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, you know, it's like, I would say that probably all of you have grown up with some prejudice in your world, right? You know, people who've delivered their prejudice at you. Is that real to you? Not anymore. Uh, it's, almost feels that it never happened since I've been in Access, though the story is still there, that being discriminated as being Jewish in a Russian environment. Yeah. But it's no longer relevant. Oh, uh, that. That. Yeah. Yes, and uh, one of the amazing things about Access, too, is when you come and you see that people from all different walks of life and religions, that you heard the story about them, that they do have the same vulnerability and the same problems that you thought, for example, white people have it all and they don't have any problems and we are the only <laughs> fucked up people and, and I love that one yeah talk about prejudice how dare you be prejudiced that way about us right <laughs> and, and, and like Jewish people they have all the money in the world and they have no problems and, and uh, they are the chosen one on this and that and then you realize it's like my goodness we are all looking for the same thing and we are all been discriminated against because yeah. one thing or the other. So that was... Yeah, I know. Years ago, I was uh, in New York, and I had this lady who was a judge, and she was black, and she said, you don't know what it's like to have, you know, like, be followed around a department store because of your race. And I said, yeah, I do. I said, but it's not race that creates discrimination. It's money. I said, I used to have long hair. I looked like a hippie. I wore, you know, bell bottoms and you know, flip-flops and that kind of stuff, and I would be followed around department stores because I wasn't dressed well enough. And it's like, and then I discovered I was being followed, and I went, well, that sucks. So I went, what's it going to take to change this? And somebody gave me a belt that was worth $2,000. They gave me a belt worth $2,000. So I started wearing my $2,000 belt, and when I wore my $2,000 belt, nobody followed me around the store. <laughs> And I realized, wow, you know, the only real discrimination, the only real prejudice in life is money. And it's like, it's so bizarre to me that we try to make those things real. What is it that makes us want to believe that it's real? 
like uh, for me, uh, you know, growing up in India, the US dollar used to be like the all great, oh my goodness, you know. Yes, and, it, you it know, was God. It was God. It was yes. God. And since coming to Access in the last one year, I have created more dollars than I've ever seen in my life, you know. So it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So God has finally shined on you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I love it. I was I was somewhere recently, and it's like they, I think it was here in Costa Rica, and they had a sign on the back of the car that said, In God We Trust. I went, I thought that was an American saying. I thought that was on the American dollar bill, you know, that In God We Trust. And apparently, and somebody said, It's religion, dude. <laughs> oh. I'm not the brightest soul sometimes. <laughs> so, So it's like, you know, it's like, with access, it's like I don't have a point of view about religion. You know, it's like what you, you know, who you choose to worship, who you choose to study, who you choose to believe in is, you know, is, is your choice. And, and I try to keep that, you know, it's like my point of view is we all are connected to the oneness, the God source that is all things. And it's like, have you found since you've been doing access that your religious upbringing has either interfered or created something as a problem for you? Yes, being a Hindu, uh, being a Hindu, I have, we have a lot of things to believe in religion and deities, the god and the goddesses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while I was a kid, I was being told to worship this god, that god, and if you need something, you need to worship this god. If you need money, we had a certain god for money. If you need happiness, we have a certain god for happiness. And coming into so, access, did all those gods give you all those things you asked for? No. <laughs> That was the reason I gave up God, yeah. because he never answered my friggin' prayers. <laughs> Nothing. And coming into Axis and looking at it, it was like, that's stupid. I mean, what are you asking us to do for? Yeah. What is it for? And nothing. Access gave me basically everything. It changed my money. It changed my relationship. It changed my health. It changed everything. So that's it's, terrible. I know. And growing up uh, in Egypt as an Arabic male in a male-dominant society, and my family were Muslims, uh, in, in, in my religion, uh, you were always assured of that you are going to hell no matter what, unless God decides otherwise. <laughs> so, And that is totally up to him. And they go into what you are doing wrong and what you are not doing that is wrong and what you might be doing that is wrong that you're Even not doing. Even though you doing. don't know you're doing it. Yes, yeah. so even you're doing it, you're doomed. So you are doomed no matter what. And everybody is doomed, and the whole world is fucked up, and they are all going to burn in hell unless they do But aren't the Americans better? Uh, well, uh, access uh, brings to your awareness is uh, uh, that uh, we have a similarity in oneness that, uh, that this reality, 99.999% yeah. of people are choosing craziness. Yeah. And it's like, and it's funny because like, it's like, it's like, you all grew up in different cultures, but it's like, didn't you notice that what was really not working for you was the insanity everybody was choosing? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So it's like you grew up as a what a half Danish, half Mexican, half Danish. Born so in you, Holland. So you're the, so the you're like a a, a Dexican. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I say is that no matter where I go, I'm a foreigner. Yeah. And that has really changed how I see the world. Like, yeah. I can't get into all of that craziness because. I've been moving from place to place all my life, and I've been seeing all these different ways in which How people function. How old are function. you? I'm 20. You're 20? Yeah. You're gorgeous, by the way, just <laughs> in Thank case you. anybody wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name again? It's oh. El. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, you see how people, they're deciding all these different things, and they're living by all these different rules and different structures, and you start to realize how none of that is really what matters. Yeah. You begin, it's like the one thing I've found with Access is you begin to realize what's really relevant for you, not what's relevant by other people's points of view. Yeah. Well, one of the things about Access is the celebration of your difference and yeah. not trying to fit in uh, anymore. And I love that what she said is I'm a foreigner wherever I go. What, as an expat, you know. Because you're living I, in Italy, yeah, right? I live in yeah. Italy and I have now an Italian passport. Um, but I'm not Italian, 
and I'm not even American anymore because exactly. there's no going back after yeah. almost 20 years uh, living abroad. And with Access, you actually recognize that you were different anyway before you even left your house. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no... Yeah. So I mean, did any of you find that comforting to realize that, you know, that your difference was not a problem? Yes. Uh, for me, growing up in the communist country where anybody other than the Russian, like straight communist, were accepted, yeah. coming to Access and finding out that's okay to be different, yeah. I never could fit in in the reality that I was living in, either in Russia, even here. Yeah. Up till access, I have an accent, I'm Jewish. There's always something yeah, different. Yeah, but the thing is that your, you know, like your accent, being Russian, forget about the Jewish part. They don't even hear that. Right. You know? I was like, I was very cute because like when I grew up, my, my, one of my neighbors was married to a Russian woman. And she was the strangest woman. She used to go out and buy her kids clothes, but she always bought clothes that would fit them in three years so that they, you know, would have something for the future. But they never fit them now. They were always three, you know, three years too large. And, and my mother, who was not, it's like she wasn't really a prejudiced person, except about the idea that you didn't want to take advantage of people that had less than you. She was always, you know, they're poor, so you can't eat at their house. So it's like I was never allowed to eat at their house, except I could have apricots from their trees because their trees weren't the same as their financial reality. So it's like I could eat the apricots at their house, but I wasn't allowed to eat anything else because they were poor. And then there was a Mexican family down the road, and they were poor, so I wasn't allowed to eat at their house either. And so, I mean, they had chickens in their backyard, and they had goats in their backyards, and they... You know, it's like, and they grew their own vegetables, and they were poor. Well, I was about 13, I think it was, and it's like, all of a sudden, the lot next door, which had been theirs the whole time and nobody knew, they built a six-unit apartment building on it. <laughs> How poor were they really? <laughs> you know, it's like, and people have this prejudice, you know, they go, well, they're poor, so don't, you know, don't do that. My mother's thing was always never eat at a poor people's house because you're going to starve them to death. <laughs> interesting point of view. Yes, exactly. interesting point of view. I love, Gary, that you talked about the culture of um, rich as opposed to poor, like walking in the store with the belt yeah. on. Uh, because uh, my dad used to say the same thing, you know, don't go down to the projects and eat. They always had abundance of food. Yeah. It was always really warm there. Yeah. And uh, and so I was like, well, we're cold because we keep the the thermostat at a certain temperature and we only we have to finish everything on our plates they who have you know nothing. much less money nothing you can throw stuff away they've got the windows open in the winter i mean it you know what is this prejudice this culture of poverty yeah that we function from? it's like i think the only real prejudice in life is truly the culture of poverty that's the only one that's actually real to me because i look everywhere and i see these people doing these strange things about the poverty it's like I was like, I know, it's like I worked in the horse business years ago and I had to go down to Mexico to try and get wetbacks to come across to work at the thing. And so I was the guy who went down and convinced people to come across the border to work at this stable. And it's like they would take me into these houses and they would have dirt floors, but they were speck and span. They were clean as all get out. And they would have tequila to feed me. And tequila goes from my tongue to my brain instantaneously. It doesn't even get to my stomach. And I could get drunk in three and a half seconds on tequila. But they always gave me the worm. Oh, Ooh, gross. <laughs> I didn't want to eat a worm. But it's like that was considered the delicacy of tequila. And it's like, and I went, oh, no, please, God, don't make me do that again. I ate about 10 worms before I finally got to the point where I got, I can't drink tequila. I, I'm on the wagon now. <laughs> <laughs> I found the way out was to be on the wagon. Is it like the cat uh, putting the mouse on your lap as like a welcome? Uh, yeah. I love you. <laughs> yeah. It's I love you. Yeah. It's like I had a cat like that who used to bring home the dead mice and the dead. She'd bring the dead mice and the dead birds and leave them on the front porch for me. And I knew she thought it was like really good. But an offering. <laughs> an offering to me for, you know, a thank you for having, you know, taken care of her and taken her in and fed her. But man, that was not my favorite thing. <laughs> and it's like, and I buried more damn mice and more damn 
you know, birds. And I can tell you, finally, I realized that if I left them there long enough, she'd eat them because she had already told me she was honoring me. And then if I didn't eat it, that meant I had given it back to her. But I didn't know that. And it's like you don't know the way cultures work. So it's like, so in access, have you learned more about other cultures? Absolutely. And that's, that's why I think travel is so important. It is really the, one of the best uh, educations uh, you can get. Years ago, I worked uh, in Rome with a uh, film festival where we would bring uh, young film students together. And at the end of each year, the students from Israel, um, together with the students from Lebanon, which I swear to this day are actually the same people, um, would be on stage crying and thanking us for bringing them together because yeah. they had no means of communication before then and were unable to continue their communications after. So who is it, really, is it with this economics that we're talking about yeah. that is invested in keeping the cultures Well, it's separate? like the thing is that the one thing I noticed is that literally cultures are created as separations in order to maintain the divisiveness of money. Economics. Economics. It's like all prejudice and all cultures as separations. You know, it's like if you're Russian Jew, then you have what status in Russia? Uh, in Russia, nothing. I could not even play basketball because I was Jewish. Wow. That's just That's, friggin' bizarre, isn't and it? And I was only that 10 black years people old. Have that. You, That's you were only 10 years old. What? That's for black people to basketball. I just want to say. Holy pass me all this. Yeah. All this is yeah, fine. Yeah, but there <laughs> aren't any of those black people in Russia. Okay. okay Can we just all say? Right, all right. Okay. Good. Yeah. You know. So. Yes. Yeah. So there was no. Uh, I couldn't go to college. Yeah. And when I was 16, my mom decided that's it. We have to leave because there was no future for me in wow. Russia. What I've watched is over the years, it's like I've gone to different cultures. And for me, I'm always trying to figure out what the cultural thing is. Uh, and because I, I, I get different cultures. And in the 70s, I went, you know, I was a hippie, smoke, dope smoking guy who went, you know, on a trip to Europe to find God or another joint, one of the two. But, <laughs> and, while I was on this trip, it's like what I noticed is what I wanted to find out is about how the people were. And one of the things that occurred for me is I went to, I went to uh, Marrakesh and I had picked up some people that were hitchhiking, a French woman and her boyfriend, and she had been a teacher for disabled children, you know, that were deaf. And she invited me to go with her to the adjutant general of Rabat's house for dinner. And it's like, I am the only English-speaking person in the group. Everybody else speaks French. Almost nobody speaks English, just me. And it's like, and I'm the odd man out. And I'm going, wow, this feels really strange to be the odd man out. And it's like, and I'm going, okay, so how can I be more in the group? And it's like, and they brought out the things, and you know, it's like they brought out these big things, and they washed our hands, and we had rose water put on us and all this stuff. And I'm going, oh, this is cool. Now, this was an, this is like, the Adjutant General Rabat is like considered really rich, except they had one light bulb in the middle of the ceiling hanging down, and that was the light for the entire room. 100 watt bulb, some total. No candles, no nothing, just that. And it's like, and I'm watching all these people, and I'm watching the Adjutant General, and he's taking the couscous, and you're only allowed to eat with your right hand, right? Because your left hand is for wiping your butt. <laughs> it's, it's for wiping your butt. You know, so it's like, I know that I'm only supposed to eat with my right hand. I'm going, how the hell am I going to get anything in my mouth? I don't know how to do this. And they don't eat with silverware, right? They eat with their hands. So it's like I watched the adjutant general take the couscous in his hand and then roll it in a particular way until it became a little hard ball and then pop it in his mouth. So I watched so intently that I could pick it up and I could duplicate exactly what he did. And I became... Uh, a non-separate person at that moment when I was willing to step into the culture and duplicate what they were doing and do it. And I thought, wow, this is just amazing that you can create this change in somebody by just duplicating how they see things. And that's the beauty of access and the, and the grace and, um, and invitation that you are 
and that this work is um, actually being willing to enter into someone else's um, reality and invite them to see something differently. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. yes. Uh, for me, coming to Axis, it was like I found my people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. My tribe. <laughs> Any of the rest of you feel like you were the odd man out <laughs> your whole life? Yeah. Yes. 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 Like, yeah. Just like me and uh, Couscous, <laughs> okay? Yeah. It's like finding my people because now I don't have to look out for a deity or a god or a goddesses. I could create I'm your my god. life. What part of that don't you get? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to buy that? Okay, never mind. No. So, yeah, Gary that. Gary yeah. Deva. Yeah. We could no, go with I, Gary I am, Guru. I am the guru. Yeah, the I am guru. Sri Sri Baba Clara Issue. <laughs> I thought you were Pod Pod Baba. Pod Pod Baba. And the Pod Pod Baba. Yes. We could call you Baba Gary now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is what it gave me. So it gave me the part to create my life rather than looking anywhere outside. Yeah. And it gave me the whole sense of being one because when I come here and the facilitators over here, which I am seeing everyone from a different culture. And seeing the allowance and the vulnerability over here, it's more like a one, oneness over here. Well, it's like the family you always thought yeah, should exist it's, because there's yeah, no judgment. There's no judgment. And that's sort of the most amazing thing forever. Yes. This allowance is amazing. It's not, I'm going to listen to you and maybe judge you in silence. It's welcome. I really want to hear what you have to say. And, and it, there is no judgment in this, which is just amazing. Exactly. That non-judgment is such a treasure. It's such a rare thing. I've never seen it before, you know. Yeah. So that's why I love Access. Thank you. You know, also the amazing thing about Access is uh, diversity is not really the problem. We are the problem with our points of views and judgment. When you were talking about the story in, in, in Morocco uh, and the right hand and the left hand, that story comes from if you want to be right in life, you want to do everything with your right side, and the devil's way is the left side. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so basically, yeah, I didn't know they that. developed a, a herd of people that are hypnotized to do the same thing and they all have to do the same thing, eat the same way, dress the same way, pray the same way. There is no diversity. Wow. It's not welcomed. So when you come to Access and you see all these people where I am an Arab Muslim male sitting next to a Russian Jewish female, you start to ask, ask yourself the question, so for what reason are we fighting one another? Yeah, exactly. See, it's like my point of view. It's like the one, reason, one of the reasons I've done Access for all these years is I realize that if we can get the world to a place of allowance with one another, there can be no war. And it's like you can't have war and allowance in the same universe. You can only have judgment and war in the same universe. And to me, it's like, what's it going to take for the world to create from a different place? It's like I don't see the value of war. If you truly recognize that you are made of the same thing everything in the universe is made of the molecules yeah and that you are part of um of everything a uh you probably aren't jumping off a bridge so quickly or popping <laughs> pills <laughs> uh, as quickly and uh b uh you wouldn't raise a gun no uh, so quickly no. and which is um which is why i am doing this work and, and this yeah. play that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is it uh, is it the polarity of uh, you know these people that are in power that they make money out of us fighting with one another another that keeps us locked, Gary? I I think that a whole lot of what goes on in the world is like you know it's like guns are big business, you know they are major business, so it's like a whole lot of the gift of war is that we then you know like shove massive amounts of money into one country or another. And it's like, and it becomes a major part of how our countries, like, created an economic stability from our point of view. I mean, it's like the history of the earth has been that when you have an economic downturn, you get into a war in order to stimulate the economy. Yeah. Absolutely. What? Yeah, absolutely. What a crazy way to do it, because there's other ways to stimulate. So, uh, having lived in the Emirates for the last eight years, when I first went there, I saw this whole melting pot of different cultures. 
and I would look at, you know, the white people, the black people from here, there. And what is very real there is, the, again, the financial reality. Yeah. So, for example, you know, you could be working in an office doing the same job, but because you're a white person, your pay would be like a, an X amount if you're... A local Arab, your pay would be matching the white person. If you're an Asian, your pay would be much less. And, you know, all this. And, you know, I, I would have all these judgments in my universe about, you know, all this going on. And now when I've come to Access and I've started using the tools of Access and I've started creating my life, it's like I can see that all those judgments are actually what keeps people into receiving the money into their universe. Yeah. And I've been able to outcreate a, a whole, whole lot of all of that, you know. So it's like the judgment has just vanished in my universe and I can look at the people. Okay, and can, can you stop just a minute? Okay, the judgment disappearing from our universe allows us to create anything. And that's the gift that when you have no judgment... You create for yourself, but you also create for the other people around you, which is friggin' amazing. Yeah, it is. And the, the other thing what I, I'm now starting to see is I'm starting to see the kindness in people, you know, and it doesn't that matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. who they are, you know. <laughs> I'm starting to see the meanness, the selfishness in people. And I'm, I'm, I'm able to now be aware of what judgment is and what awareness is. So it's like, you know, in the, like a year, year ago, I would, you know, beat myself up just because I could notice a selfish or a mean person. I would beat myself up. But now I know it's just well, because you thought it was a judgment, not an awareness. Exactly. And it's like, that's one of the things that everybody has to get in the world. It's like, it's like seeing somebody mean, and if it's negative, that doesn't mean it's a judgment. That can mean awareness. And if it's positive, that doesn't mean it's not a judgment. And that's the thing I see people doing all the time. They try to think that that which is positive is not a judgment, and that which is negative is a judgment. It's not true. And, and you know, as an Indian, uh, living in a family, you know, where in our culture, it's like when you get married, you marry into the family, not just the person. And for the past seven or eight years, I've been living with my mother-in-law, visiting and wanting to live more and more with us. And ha I've had a really difficult time with that. Well, isn't her job to torture you to death? Exactly. And you I know thought what? that was the Indian culture. You, you know the what? The purpose of the mother-in-law was to tell, her, tell you as a wife that you're not good enough for her son. Exactly. And you know what? I've, I've been able to choose because of access. In the past one year, I have been able to speak and I have been able to say this doesn't work for me. And if you're coming, you're just staying for a month and that's it. And oh. For <laughs> oh my God. And you haven't been poisoned to death yet? Oh no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Yes. Um, coming from a joint Indian family, Okay, India What's a joint Indian Joint family? Indian family is where uh, the parents, the brothers, brothers' children, we all stay together. So we are yeah. like nine to ten people staying together in one big house. Yeah, big uh, house? Very big That's house. That's very different. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of extended family members who keep visiting us every other day. Yeah. So coming from there and coming from that culture where a girl is not allowed to go out and work or to even voice up, okay, I had a lot of difficulty to setting up my work and I, have, I had a lot of problems with my family to voice up. And coming into Access, it gave me a lot of tools and a lot of techniques to change the entire situation and manipulate them to get going my way. And that became an invitation to my other cousins who are younger to me to choose for themselves, looking at wow. me. See, you're an inspiration now. How cool is that? And you yes, know, yes. Gary, in, in, in Egypt and in the Middle East, they do circumcise the girls against oh. their will. And their reason yeah. for that, if they deny him of any sexual pleasure, then they are not going to commit adultery and the world is going to be a better place. And I do have four beautiful sisters and nieces and nephews. And then when I hear you saying that these people, whatever they choose, create that reality, but we don't have to just 
accept it. We no. can choose a different possibility that will create a different reality. And then you look in the room and you see these beautiful beings and beautiful people from all over the world. And you're like, okay, so. So I, I'm going to give you this piece of information. Just circumcising a woman doesn't stop her pleasure. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she can still have pleasure if she chooses. Totally. And that's yeah. what we get from access is, yeah. you know, people can commit the crimes against you. You still have a choice. You yeah. still have a yeah. possibility in life. Yeah. It's very amazing. You yes. Know, it's like, I'm sorry. It's like there it was a lady I was hoping would be here. She's from South Africa and she actually, her husband was killed and she was raped and she has a little daughter and she's, you know, and she still realizes that there was choice. And by a choice that she made at the time she was raped and, you know, and her husband was killed, she actually got them to let her go. After the rape, yes, but it's like at least she and her daughter are still alive. And it's like, and she's still living in South Africa because it's home. Which is another thing that's interesting to me. You can have a place that's home and you can see the, the problems in it and you can still choose a different reality. And that's way cool. Yes. What I also found out since I came to Access, it's not just my own judgments and people who are in Access judgment disappears. It also helps people around me yeah. to lose their judgments. Yeah, because when you don't choose judgment as a reality, they can't hold their judgment in existence. It begins to disappear. It sort of like falls apart because judgment exactly. requires alignment and agreement. It requires you to have, it requires the other person to have some place to keep that in existence. And when you don't have any, it's like they can't have it either. It's amazing to observe how yeah. my daughter being Jewish yeah. and her other friend who is Jewish living with an Arab in the same apartment, <laughs> loving and their friendship goes beyond cultures, yeah. beyond anything. Well, from my point of view, this is what the world should be, a place where it, you know, where culture is the joy of the difference between us and the joy of the possibility that exists because we see each other. Exactly. And the love that we can have for each other, being yeah. in oneness. Yeah. Just being one with every molecule in the world. Yeah. And the difference between this reality and the tools that our access has is like, okay, so this reality is like, how are we using our diversity to kill one another? Yeah. And access is like, how can we use our diversity to create a different future yeah, for different everybody? Different future for everybody, yeah. And it's like, that for me is what's very great. Okay, so you're 20, right? Yeah. And uh, you didn't have any problems as a kid, did you? Of course not. Not at all. Okay, good. So it's like, I mean, it's like the other day, your mother was talking about the fact that you were slightly autistic and you didn't actually talk much in the yeah. beginning of your life. Right. And it's like, have you found, because of Access, that it's now easier for you to be everything you are? Definitely. Like, since Access, my life has just changed completely. Uh, I used not to be able to talk on the phone or going out and doing small talk, things like that, where it just... They didn't it make hurt, sense to me. It? it was yeah, exactly. Yeah, it it hurt. hurt. Yeah. And now I can I come here and I can like be talking to people and they're complete strangers and they just say hi and hi and then we start talking yeah. and we can have great conversations, which is something that in the past would have just freaked me out. Yeah. Well, it's like you know being slightly autistic. One of the reasons that occurs, folks, is the fact that literally as an autistic person you pick up everybody else's thoughts feelings and emotions <laughs> dynamically yeah. and so everything that they're like freaked out about you pick up and you assume you're freaked out yeah. and it actually isn't so and is that one of the gifts you got from access realizing it actually isn't yours definitely definitely yeah because especially like when you're in large groups it's the more people there are the more points of view the more things are going on yeah and you're picking all that stuff up and with access you realize None of that is yours. Yeah, I know. Isn't that great? Okay, so I forgot to mention the title of this, you know, this show, which is really, you know, Consciousness Beyond Culture. And it's like, literally, it's like, for me, the one thing I noticed about Access is it seems to transcend all culture. And it's like, not, it doesn't transcend. It goes beyond the limitations of culture and gives you the space to be you. And it's like, so, you know, what's it like being a Latina in... And Canada and all the other weird places you've lived. 
Well, it was an advantage against this idea that I was always a foreigner. Yeah. I could be as crazy as I was. <laughs> and you'll say, oh, I'm Mexican. And they had no clue what a Mexican was, you know? know. Isn't that funny? It's it, like you're in it, Canada it, and they don't, uh, you want to really find out what a Mexican is like? Go to friggin' Australia. Okay. In Australia, they have this stuff that they call Mexican food, <laughs> which El Pollo Loco is better than that. Okay. <laughs> it's the worst stuff you ever tasted in your life. And their idea of hot sauce is ketchup with a little cilantro on it. Oh, gross. Oh. <laughs> it's like I've been to one Mexican restaurant in Perth yeah. that was actually good, except it wasn't actually Mexican. It was tapas from Spain. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the I'm confusion going, all the time, yes. That's not Mexican. But That's tapas. I, I took it and I, I thrive because there was... There were no points of view of what I could be, so I could be myself. Yeah. And that gave me a lot of freedom. And also for my children, I would send them to school and say, well, if they say something about you, you'll say, my mother is crazy and she's Mexican. So they could get away with a lot of things that other children <laughs> couldn't. Right? You're a good mom. <laughs> so, You're a good mom. No, the problem is now I'm coming back to Mexico. And it's very funny because even after 30 years and they think they don't have points of view, they do expect me to somehow conform to what a Mexican lady should be, right? Yeah. And this crazy person arrives and they all try to control me. And that I think, would be good luck. Oh, my God. Exactly. <laughs> but that's the advantage of the access tools. Yeah. I have now the tools of giving them what they can receive and whatever they cannot receive. Just keep it for myself, just for me, just for fun. Yeah. How to see it's, this it's so, how I does it? Just I'm so great. Love I'm it. So glad. I just love it. The freedom that well, Access has given me and my family. Uh, because not all of us, well, my parents do Access, my brother does Access. Does access yes. But my husband and my son think we went beyond. I mean, this You're is nuts. just. Okay, good. Just not jobs. It's fine. But they change. As we change, as we take the classes, just the first bars class and. If you haven't had a bars class, I recommend you to try it at least once. We came home and my husband was so completely different. We couldn't believe it. <laughs> Is that funny? Yeah. It's... How many of you have had the experience of your families changing after you did classes? Absolutely. And in the beginning, I actually said, you know what? It's not very fair. I'm doing all the job and they're I'm doing all fun. the work. <laughs> I'm paying all the money and they're getting better. That sucks. How wonderful is it? How, How does it wonderful get any is it? Than them? Yes, no friend. My mother has been doing access and my father has been hard of hearing for the past God knows how many years. He started to hear. And the other day, you know, we were um, sitting, uh, he was amongst a group of his friends. And one of the friends came up to us and said, you know what? He can hear us. <laughs> he, he's responding to us. You know, that was so funny. To Dad see. probably said, finally, they're talking about something of interest. Access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to hear that yes. crazy stuff in the yeah. Arab world anymore. Yeah. Well, what was really funny is like my mother was hard of hearing. And it's like, but her, her, her deaf ear changed according to which side you were talking on the thing she didn't want to hear about. <laughs> so I think sometimes deaf is a convenience, not a reality. A choice. Yes, it's a choice. You know, it's so great, uh, Gary, to hear about the title of this show, uh, Beyond Culture, because we talk about religions, different religions, and this is, you know, titillating to me. Yeah. And um, we talk about geographical boundaries. We talk about um, race, creed. And with access, you realize the culture that I belong to is a culture that questions. Yeah, culture of consciousness. Culture of questions consciousness. Everything. Questions that has no judgment. I recognize myself in people all over the world that have that culture. Yeah. And so... And it, uh, it's so amazing when you run into somebody who has that culture, even if they're not involved in access. I mean, I've run into people like that in, you know, in Turkey in the bazaar. And absolutely. it's like, and they look at me with a strange look as I talk to them and they go, huh? You know, and then they go, for you? You can have it for this much. And it's like, and there's no bargaining. They just give me the lowest friggin' price they can. And I'm going, how did that happen? Did they recognize it too? I love what you yeah. said about going back to Mexico and they expect certain things of you. And you give them what they can receive. Yeah. And no more. So the, that judgment, that no judgment thing, how much in, in your, the various 
homes that you go back to is not only um, not aligning and agreeing, but not resisting and reacting to yeah. the gods. That's probably the, the greatest thing of all is like you don't you no longer have to resist and react, nor do you have to align and agree with the point of view. You go, uh huh. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting point of view. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, being a Hindu, there's a lot of rivalry going on with Muslims. Hindu and Muslims. Really? Never yeah. noticed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Here we, here we go when again. I left, here we go again. Yeah, all when our I left my <laughs> points of views, which my family basically carried about Muslims from generations, yeah. and I had no points of view about a Muslim, no judgments about it. When uh, I live in a locality where we have Muslims as my neighbors, yeah. when they got to know that I'm traveling to Costa Rica for my facilitators, I had the lady come and tell me that, oh, before you go, I'm going to make you a biryani so that you're going to have a great, you're going to have a great journey and you're going to have a safe journey. So I'm going to do that for you. So every time I pass by, they are willing to do a lot of things for me yeah. just out of love because I have no points of view about them being what they are. Yeah. So it's like no if we had no point of view about what anybody was, whether you were Hispanic or, or Muslim or Hindi or whatever, it's like literally that strange place of having no point of view gives the other person the chance to care about you. Isn't that wonderful? And one of the other amazing things about uh, access, Gary, is you always encourage us to ask questions. With religion, they tell you, you have to leave your brain outside of the mosque or the church. God can ask anyone what he would like, but you should never ask him. You what, should never ask God. You should never yeah. ask God or anyone anything. Just take what you get and don't ask any questions. And that's kind of like crazy or what? Well, I don't think it's crazy. I think it's the way that it's like the difficult for me is what I noticed is I went to a whole lot of different churches, cults, and religions before I started Access. And one of the things I noticed that was really continuous about all of them is they were all trying to find a way to control you to believe what they believed. And my sense is that religion is not about setting us free. It's about controlling us. And pretty much every church culture religion is about how do we control the people and how we get them to give us their money and it's like i hate to say it but i kind of have the feeling that maybe the majority of churches are about the money more than they are even about the kindness or caring you know it's like i, I went to spain in the 70s and i was startled because there was so much poverty at the time and that was when franco was still in power and it was like massive amounts of poverty everywhere and there would be these churches and they'd have these iron gates in front of all the saints and stuff that they, they were supposed to worship. And on them were all these jewels and things. And there were the people starving in the streets and there were jewels encrusted and gold and all this kind of stuff in the church. And I thought, that makes no sense to me. Why would you have jewel encrusted gold in the church and people starving in the streets? Wouldn't the purpose of religion be to take care of the people? But... That's the way I've always been. I had that strange point of view from the beginning. But in that same trip, I went to Morocco, and I went to, I went to uh, you know, the bazaar in Marrakesh, and they had these, these storytellers, and they had these snake charmers. And I watched the snake charmers enthrall the kids with what they were able to do with the snakes. And I went, now this is something that people should experience, this place where they deal with death as though it is just part of life. And that's the thing I noticed about that. And it's like when I was going through Morocco, and it's like we're going along in our car, and we're driving along, and here's, here's these, there's a camel, a donkey, a cow, and a sheep walking around this place that's supposed to get, you know, like, like it's how they get the wheat out of the shaft. And it's like, and they're doing it, and they're throwing the stuff up in the air, and all the stuff's, you know, floating away. And this is how they are, you know, it's like I'm going, I just walked back 5,000 years in time. And, I, and, oh, welcome to the Costa Rican cat that's here to talk to. Okay? <laughs> so it's like, we, you know, it's like I'm looking at this place, looking at it, it's like I just walked 5,000 years into the past. And I'm with these strange people that I picked up at, 
a because I had a car, but I didn't have enough money for all the gas. So I would pick people up at the American Express and use them as people who would contribute to the gas to get to different places. And I'm with these people, and I said, "Let's stop at that. Let's stop at that uh, market over there." And it was all Arabs, okay? All these Arabs in their, you know, like 8,000 layers of clothes. And I'm going, how the hell do these people not burn up? But I had already learned by being at, at one city where I wore my shorts and every man was whistling at me. <laughs> and I went, okay, I got to wear long pants. It's not appropriate to wear short shorts. I learned. I'm not stupid. And I... And we went into this place, and it's like it was so funny to watch the people because they'd look at us, and it's like I had no fear because I knew I could be aware. And they looked at us sort of like, you people are stopping here? Are you crazy? This is not a safe place for you white people. But I knew that that was their point of view, and I would just smile and nod at them and ask them for something. And we had an amazing experience with that. Then we went to, we went to Essawara, which is a little town on the coast of, of Morocco, which had been a, it had been a uh, seaport for the Romans, and it's like, and there were still these, these old aqueducts that were all broken down, not bringing water out of the mountains anymore, but. The thing is, the nice thing about the Romans is they went in, they took all the water out of the mountains and killed all the trees, and so there weren't any more trees to grow and hold water so that there was no water to bring to the coast anyway. But, you know, it's like, wow, people are really not smart, are they? You know, it's like, it's like, and realizing that a whole lot of the deserts had occurred because the Romans took all the water out of the center of the thing, and I'm going, mankind is not the brightest creature on the planet. And I still have that point of view. But at any rate, we're in Essawara, and it's like, and it's like there's this giant, you know, full moon. And it's like really close to the ground, and it's gold and beautiful. And it's like, and all of a sudden, this guy goes swooping up this this uh, stairway to the top of the the aqueduct with his cape, you know, flying in the air. And I'm going, really? This is real? And that night, that afternoon, we had arrived, and there was this young guy who had this donkey that had gotten loose, and he had all of this wood on him. Because they'll, you know, they'll collect wood until, like, there's so much wood you can only see the legs of the donkey. <laughs> and then they sit on his back and beat his head to make him go forward. And I'm going, how the hell did they get a donkey to do that? <laughs> and I was stunned. But at any rate, I helped him. You know, it's like his donkey got away from him. And I worked with horses, so I went, ah, I can help him catch this horse. So I went out and helped him catch his donkey. And he came back, and he gave me this big chunk of hash and, like, talked to me in Arabic. And I had no idea what the hell he said, but I assume it was thank you. <laughs> and that night, we went to bed, and we all went to sleep in our sleeping bags and stuff by the car. And that night, we were the only campground that didn't have all their shoes stolen. I went, hmm, being helpful and being aware and being contributive really does make a difference in the world. And it's like, I think that's what all of you are discovering by the places you're learning with access. That contribution you are to a different possibility creates a different reality that creates your life is easier and everybody else's is better too. Would that be accurate? Totally. Yes, totally. Yeah. totally. Yeah. So is there anything else you guys want to say? I have a question for you, Gary. Yes. Um, it seems like in the past, like uh, Egypt was a country of diversity where Jews and Christians and Muslim, you know, uh, were living, at yeah. least making money, all of them. And then it shifted to a more militant and now dictatorial uh, place. Dictatorial yeah. and yeah. then um, uh, more religious extrem extrem extremism and now it is shifting. So uh, why, uh, like, do you, what do you think about the, uh, like the United States is getting a little bit more militant than it used to be more liberal? Gee, really? Had not noticed. So... <laughs> So do you think uh, we should take our time in choosing consciousness or do you... Uh, no, how I think do you the see? more people choose consciousness, the less easy it is for the dictatorial militant universe to exist. It becomes harder and harder for that to be the way we live. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, 
PBS, the you know, public broadcasting system uh, documentary, and they said that 51%, you know, that in these four major cities, violent crime had gone down 51%. Now, if it had been like 46, 48, 52 or something, I wouldn't have questioned it. But four cities, 51% exactly in all of them? I thought, wow, what's really going on? And so my sister worked for the San Diego Police Department at the time, so I talked to her and I said, so has violent crime gone down in San Diego? She says, yes, 51%. I went, really? I said, so what do they attribute that to? Ah, you know, she was a civilian employee for the police department. She said, ah, they have no idea. They're a bunch of idiots. She didn't like police people very much. And she said, you know, it's like they have no idea what made it go down, but it's gone down. And I looked at it and I went, wow, what that is? is consciousness. The more we raise consciousness in the world, the more that we all choose to be more conscious. Violent crime cannot continue to exist in the face of consciousness. Yeah. Gary, I, I, it's a little bit along the lines of uh, Abe's question, and I'm sure there's nothing beyond the scope of this <laughs> no. program. Um, so the, there seems to be a linearity um, in war and in, the, in poverty and in economics. Is there, um, we're, we're doing one at a time here. Um, each one, yeah. touch one, te- you know, facilitate but one. Each one is there a quantum leap? Well, that's yeah, gonna there's happen? a quantum leap that is occurring because it's like the the thing is that it's like you, each one of you, is connected to at mm-hmm. least three hundred fifty thousand other people for every lifetime you've had anywhere, any time, any place. So it's like if you get rid of your limitations, your judgment, then you also get rid of all the people that you ever affected in any lifetime. So when you destroy your judgments, you create a different possibility in the world. So let's do a little clearing for everybody out there in the audience. So what creation are you using to invoke the judgments of prejudice you are choosing? Everything that is times a godzillion, we just trying to create it all. Yes. yes. Right and wrong, good and bad, pot and pock, all nine shorts, boys and beyonds. I think we need to do it again. So what creation are you using to invoke the limitations, the judgments of prejudice you are choosing? Everything that is times a godzillion, we just want to create it all. Yes. yes. Right and wrong, good and bad, pot and pock, all nine shorts, boys and beyonds. And that includes yeah. perpetuating and um, sustaining, resisting and reacting to and um, aligning and agreeing with? It includes all of that? Yeah, it includes all of that because basically as near as I can see, the the greatest difficulty I see is that people will, you know, it's like I've been with people who are in ghetto neighborhoods, for instance, you know, they'll go into the ghetto and then they get all frightened and they get upset. Well, it's like if you get frightened and you get upset, you cut off your awareness. If you're willing to have your awareness, you know what actually will work and you know what's really possible. So, so unfortunately we're running out of time and it's like, this has been one of the most interesting conversations and conscious I personally have had, you know, it's like, I don't care about you people out there in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. But it's like, I'm hoping that this will give all of you a chance to realize that, you know, it's like, if you really want to change the world, you got to choose to change you and you being in allowance, you being, you being the gift you are in the world is the gift that will create more possibility for all of us across the planet and including the cat, and, uh, <laughs> and that will create a greater possibility than we ever thought was possible. And that's my world, and welcome to our world. And it's like, have you all heard the theme song of Access, Welcome to the World? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, we love it. Welcome to the world. We've been waiting for you. You're a miracle and a dream come true. And all of you guys really are miracles. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for helping me. Thank you. And I hope that this stimulates all of you out there in the world to realize that you are valuable Don't stop being you. Choose to be you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Conversations in Consciousness. Thank you all. Thank Thank you.